All right. Um, so my name is uh, Colonel Desai. I'm online as Movex. And um, what talk about today is uh, kind of a look at the effects of intellectual property on us and um, you know what life would be like if we had to suddenly reinvent the wheel, live without Silicon Valley. Um, this is actually my first Nauticon, and so far it's been really awesome. I like the staff's great. Met a lot of cool people so far, so very happy to be here. Um, I, like most of you, I grew up hacking on software and hardware. I always try to figure out how things work. Um, a lot of discovered reverse engineering, just been confronted by a black box, try to figure out how to tear it open and such. Um, I'm a little bit younger, so my first machine was actually a Pentium 75, like a very nice box, not a 486 or anything. Um, I ended up going to school for electrical engineering and computer engineering. Uh, I learned a lot of just science, tech, math, but I still would get confronted by an occasional black box of software or hardware I could not get past. Uh, right now I'm employed as a hardware engineer um, at a small company in Michigan. And uh, what we do is we roll our own uh, machines from the ground up. So we get to do the schematic design, we get to do the PCB layout, we get to do our own bio software, OS software, and basically we get to know the machine from the ground up. So as a side benefit, I got a lot of answers to how those boxes from uh, the past that I had been working on operated. And it was kind of like getting the answer key, basically. All this documentation was just in front of me and explained how everything worked in the first place. Though, you know, after a few months there, I realized I would have never, ever have figured out a lot of that hardware or software if I didn't sign a few forms and get all the documentation that explains how everything worked from the start. Um, I didn't know, couldn't know how, you know, I knew the basics. I knew when I pushed a power button on a machine, processor loaded, executed code from this address, after the initialization was done, it booted into the OS, and if I was running Linux, I knew how everything was working at that point, but I still didn't know the deep, low-level functioning of it. I didn't know how exactly it loaded and fetched the code. I didn't know what the bus interfaces were like. I didn't know any of that. It just mostly worked. Um, you know, some argue that it's a bit far-fetched. You don't need to know the nitty-gritty of how everything operates. You know, you don't even know exactly how your laptop does everything. I, those people probably aren't at Nauticon. Uh, part of it is curious. I want to know how everything works, and humans are curious. You know, I would like to keep taking everything apart unless I, until I know how everything works. And it's it's mostly feasible with with the resources on the internet and the resources available to us now. You can get pretty far in trying to figure out how things work. The other part was kind of concerning, though. It's a little bit paranoid, but I thought it would make for a good thought exercise. Uh, if one day your devices stopped operating, let's say Skynet struck because it's a thought exercise, and um, you know, could we pick up the pieces and get things running again? Could we reinvent the wheel? You know, could you redesign like this laptop from the ground up if you needed to? Except in this case, instead of reinventing the wheels or something, it's chips. You know, nanometer scale, billions of transistors, chips, or Billions of line of code, ret stretching from rolling in smart toasters to stock markets. So first, I was thinking we had to start looking at intellectual property and the mechanisms that exec exist to protect it. And we also, I think, should look at why we need to protect IP in the first place. There are a lot of legitimate reasons, and it'd be it's kind of disingenuous to dismiss the entire concept as evil. Uh, then, since we're all geeks at heart, we can look at some real-life examples of hardware and some black boxes that get in the way. And then finally, we can do a few case studies on our favorite electronic devices and see how we'd get everything working again. So first thing, intellectual property is kind of a nebulous term. It's been bandied about a lot recently. And essentially, it's a legal construct that attempts to codify intangible assets by granting exclusive rights to the said assets. So in plain English, that means things I think of in my mind, music, books, inventions, software in some cases. I want to grant gain exclusive rights to these creations. On one hand, it protects me because that gives me financial security and it gives me exclusive ownership of the creation of my mind. But on the other hand, it creates a legal minefield for everybody else. So let's say I've come up with a method of infinite energy involving magnets. I'll be selling them after the talk. In return for publicly sharing how my awesome magnet invention works, the United States or whatever country I found my patent work in will grant me exclusive rights to my magnets for some time period. It might be a few years, could be a few decades, it varies. So anyone who trods on my magnetic energy generator will find themselves attacked by my crack team of lawyers because it's my patent, assuming it was granted to me. So the downside, if you can call it that, is 
everybody knows exactly how my magnet generator works because in the patent disclosure, I disclose like, hey, this is how my magical invention works. And after the initial patent term is up, people can legally clone it. Of course, you know, you can probably get, you probably find cheap Chinese knockoffs of it or something, but legally, it's supposed to be protected for the period of the initial patent term. This is good because I'm protected. And it also puts my work out in the public domain. So libraries, whatever uh, resources, people can all download, they can store this patent, which is good because it kind of puts it on a permanent record. So if I blow myself up with magnets, the next guy may not make that mistake. And it's not lost. This is also bad though because patent, patents can be abused a lot. Uh, I don't know how many are familiar with patent trolls, but a lot of companies have earned a bad rep by just buying a patent, sitting on it, and then 10 years later when someone does something remotely related to that patent, they just blanket lawsuit with the intent of just settling out of court for some sum of money. And they're not going to do anything with the patent, they just happen to own it. And they're not going to develop it further, they just want their payday. So you run into that a lot. Uh, free trade issues are common, especially with pharmaceuticals. Um, there's a concern that pharmaceutical companies in the United States invest billions of you know, research and development money on drugs, but to make these drugs available to like developing countries and such, they're concerned that if they're the sole patent holder and sole manufacturer of it, they can charge essentially whatever they want for this drug to countries that have no way of affording it. Software patents are a very recent issue. I'm sure, you know, if you're in this audience, you've probably read about them. Uh, people want to patent, you know, user interfaces, certain methods of just algorithms are attempting to be patented. And there's also a new issue with biological patents, patenting certain organisms, gen genomes, genetic codes. Uh, Seeds, yep, uh, Monsanto and uh, GMO, exactly, yep. But now what if I wanted to protect my awesome magnet generator, but I did not want to disclose how exactly the magnets work? Or what if I've disclosed my magnet generator, but I haven't shared how I manufacture it? This is where trade secrets come in. This doesn't expire like a patent, but if someone else independently discovers magnet generation technology, I'm, I'm out of luck. You know, they, it's out there, I have no legal recourse, they just happen to discover it. That's the downside. So they're really commonly used to protect manufacturing techniques. So after I file the initial patent, my trade secrets are in the best way to make that device, to increase efficiency, to increase yields of that. I need any improvements I make to the design after the patent, I would generally roll, roll into a trade secret as well. Everyone might know about it, but I've got the secret way to make it, make them as far more efficient, meaning I can sell them cheaper, meaning I profit more. Or you may be a large beverage company and you don't want anyone knowing your formula. The formula for Coca-Cola is actually not patented, it's a trade secret. Because if it was patented, we would all know what's in it. And I don't, I still don't think anyone's been able to figure out what exactly is in Coca-Cola yet. So how would I protect my trade secrets? In this non -dis NDA, non-disclosure agreement, also called confidentiality agreement, proprietary information agreement, secrecy agreement. A legal contract that is ostensibly used to ensure certain information remains secure. So why would we need this? If I am the guy holding the information, I want to share information with you, but I want to control what you do with it. I want to control who you tell it to. I want to control how far you distribute it. I want control over the information I'm sharing to you. If I'm receiving the data, I need information from you, and you, guys, you want to control what I do with your information, then I don't have a choice because the only way you'll give me your information is if I sign a non-disclosure agreement. The enforcement method, if I break it, is the legal system. Uh, the contracts differ, but I may have to pay a financial penalty. Uh, if I'm providing a service to you, I may lose, lose the payments, just sued for breach of contract, a wide variety of protections from the legal system. The time spans can vary. Um, you know, if I were working on a device, it can just remain in place until the device is released. So for computer hardware, a lot of review sites are given NDAs that expire on the official release date of the product. And um, that's in contrast to some NDA that's, that lasts just arbitrarily a number of years or forever. So the one-way NDA, let's say I've got this really cool widget, I put a lot of time and money into it, and I want to need a little help putting it together, and I'm planning on patenting this device. You're a reputable sub-widget manufacturer, and I'd like your help in finishing my product. But you do a lot of business in sub-widgets. You help out my competitors, you do a lot of business with a lot of people, so I need you to promise to keep my information secure and properly utilized. So in this case, I would give, you know, your pinky swear, or I could give you an NDA. So in a one-way NDA, I'm setting the conditions. So I'm going to say, you know, hey, don't take my idea and start using it for yourself. Um, I can control. I can say, hey, 
My information needs to stay in a separate filing cabinet that's locked at all times, away from the rest of your customer data. Um, if I say this part of my stuff needs to remain confidential, you have to keep it as such. And essentially, I dictate all the conditions for this agreement. This protects the intellectual, it protects my IP. So I can work with you and get my widget done, and if you break it, I can come after you for monetary penalties, legal penalties, etc. And this is really common. Um, uh, parts uh, like uh, distributors like Avnet, Arrow, et cetera, we have their reps come to our building and they have to sign an NDA promising not to share what we disclose to them with anyone else. And it's, it's a very common agreement. And uh, startups and inventors also love this because they're often sitting on a new revolutionary idea and maybe they need to get a consultant on board or they need to get venture funding or they need to get a quote for supplies. So they are afraid of people stealing their idea. They will try to make the other party sign an NDA. And the originator is going to ask easy, OK, we've got some legal protection for idea. They can't just run with their idea and turn us down. Because a common fear is you're an inventor. You're one guy. You're going to go up to a venture capital fund. You're going to explain your idea. They'll turn you down. And then they're just going to run away with your idea and do it anyways. <coughs> Though I did read a recent article that said some venture capitalists actually consider this an amateur move. And I don't know how much the truth of that is, but I thought it was interesting because I thought this was a pretty common, pretty common occurrence. Uh, and, and all of us have run into a receiving end of an NDA pretty easily. Um, data sheets, information access, for especially for complex devices, you need to sign an NDA to get in the first place. Uh, if you're an independent contractor, often your client is going to make you sign an NDA. Uh, site visits, if you're like a field guy or something, you're visiting companies, a lot of times they're going to say, Hey, anything you say here, you can't tell anyone or we're going to break your knees. Um, interviews, like I think Google might still do it. Uh, their interview process was NDA. You know, you can't share the questions we ask you and such with anybody else. And of course, if they take you on a tour of the campus, whatever you see there needs to stay in your head. You can't tell anyone about it. Uh, exams, a lot of professional licensing exams. That agreement you signed at the beginning that says you're not going to tell anyone what's on the exam, that's a non-disclosure agreement. Uh, video game beta tests are also NDA, so like the WoW beta testers, any MMO beta testers are actually under an NDA because revealing what's on, revealing the results of this test beforehand can affect their bottom line. And uh, your job, uh, when you sign your employment contract, you've also probably signed an NDA for for your company. And if you run, oh, it's gotta work. If you run a follow these, chances are the guy with the NDA can afford a better lawyer than you can, which means they're gonna win. Two-way NDAs are very similar, except now both parties <coughs> have a vested interest in keeping the information secret. Uh, let's say we're collaborating on a joint widget project. I'm delivering some hardware, and you're doing the software for this. We are just going to agree to keep the details of this widget between us. It's a mutual agreement. We can both set the conditions and such, warm fuzzies all around. Real example, um, commonly between a BIOS vendor and a chip manufacturer, they're going to have an NDA. The BIOS vendor can develop the BIOS, and the chip vendor Gaz says, hey, we've got BIOSes available for our chip. So they're going to have a mutual NDA between the two to facilitate the exchange of the information needed. Uh, you know, I mentioned that some companies require an NDA in place before you even get to see a single data sheet. If you ever go to like Intel.com and try to pull down a data sheet for, say, Sandy Bridge or something, you're not going to get very far. And there's a few reasons um, that I've heard justified. Um, you know, none of them have ever told me straight, like, oh, this is why we require an NDA. Um, it could be security. It could be logistics. And in some cases, uh, for some specialty devices, the company offering the device is themselves under an NDA from a fourth party. So for security, it's kind of like security through obscurity, which is, you know, as we know, a terrible idea. Um, proprietary software protocols are often NDA'd to control uh, who gets to officially use that protocol. Uh, I'm thinking of Skype. I don't know if you were. A pub, pub. People have been trying to reverse engineer Skype ever since it came out. And I think it's, it's made varying degrees of pro progress so far. Um, and in some jurisdictions, reverse engineering is against the law. And you could get legal action brought by the owner against you as he's and desist and such. And the interesting thing is, despite the, DM the DMCA in America, despite it having a lot of evil-ish effects, it actually allows reverse engineering for the purposes of ensuring, quote, end quote, interoper interoperability with other software. So that's actually not against which is a DMCA. Uh, hardware security. Uh, software isn't the only one that can uh, enjoy security through obscurity. Hardware can do the exact same thing. For example, let's say for manufacturing purposes, if I flip a certain pin at a certain time, I can bypass all security measures and write to the entirety of flash memory. 
It's good for manufacturing, not so good for the end user. They should probably not be able to do that. Or there could be certain registers that need to be programmed with certain magic values for proper operation. Or there are secret manufacturing registers to put into a test mode for the factory. Uh, it could also be logistics. Um, a lot of older computer hardware, the user manual, Appendix A, was a full set of schematics for the entirety of the machine. Hardware has grown incredibly in complexity since then. And it's actually very common for complex devices. You need the vendor's help in getting it working in the first place. And the vendor has on staff, they pay the salaries of field engineers, application engineers, and they're your point of contact there. And you're, you know, they'll come visit your site, you'll call them up if you have problems getting that chip working. This also costs money because they've got to pay the salary of that guy, which means that in a lot of cases, if you're not going to hit a certain volume, they're just going to say, sorry, we can't really, you know, we're not going to waste our time with you. Or for individual hackers, especially, there's no point in caring about us. We're not a revenue generating source. Or, you know, perhaps a company is using technology that they themselves are subject to NDA for. Um, if you have some schematics, will actually have the pages with those chips in it redacted because of NDA. And there's actually some open source hardware that I've seen that uses uh, chips, like uh, I think from Marvel, that are under NDA. So when you get to the page with that chip on it, it's just a black box that says NDA required. It kind of defeats the purpose. Uh, you know, there's a reason all these protections exist, which are good for the IP owners. Um, they can make things, however, difficult for us, the open source hacking community. And not to mention, it also uh, generates a huge barrier of entry due to cost. Uh, many of the software packages using electronic design are completely out of reach, a reach for us. Um, PCB design tools, LTM cadence can be upwards of $5,000 a seat. Logic design, I think, uh, I was talking, actually one of the guys here at Nauticon used to work for a logic design company, and I think he said they're around $250,000 per seat, and you need five or six seats. And there's also a huge variety of proprietary, high, highly specialized tools that are just incredibly pricey, very out of frame for us. Luckily, you know, there's a lot of good uh, hobby class tools out there. There's cheap, cheapish oscilloscopes, multimeters aren't too bad, you can afford this. But to reverse engineer or hack at more advanced systems, they're not going to cut it. A high speed oscilloscope you need for differential signals starts at the price of a nice BMW and goes up to three or four of them. Uh, advanced debuggers for debugging Intel and AMD hardware, you have to pay several thousand dollars for. Spectrum analyzers are incredibly expensive. Uh, logic analyzers, we have affordable USB logic analyzers, but for PCI and other buses, you're going to need a much larger, much more complicated device. To be completely fair, this is more so, you know, it's critical for the developers of the hardware to need it, not so much for hacking reverse engineering. You know, part of it is being creative and getting the job done without having any of these devices. But it would be nice, it's nice to have, nice to dream about. Um, also, commercial products are designed with Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yep. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, digital signal oscilloscope. So um, it basically, the littler ones are like digital digital oscilloscope, but the larger ones can our multi gigahertz bandwidth. You can probe uh, high speed differential signals like PCI Express, serial APA, and such. And I think the most recent quote we got at work actually for new just probes, not even the scope, uh, an individual probe was I think five or six thousand dollars just for that. So incredibly expensive. Um, and then commercial products are designed with one purpose in mind, and that's you've got to make them as easy as possible. Parts will be designed to be easy for machines to assemble. There's no need to have debug circuitry or headers on the final product. Um, there might be right ones, manufacturing bits or jumpers. Um, for desktop machines, the BIOS is flashed, the code is written to the flash, and then they flip bits, which only give you read-only access from then on. And uh, especially portable products like cell phones, I think every successive iPhone gets progressively more and more difficult to disassemble without breaking the thing. And they're intended to be replaced, not repaired. So uh, a lot of, and I think the new iMac is, uh, I think for iMacs you need suction cups to get it off there. And I think a few devices are actually epoxyed shut too. So there's no chance of getting it open without causing some damage to it. Um, also some protocol specs aren't actually fully really available. You need to be a member of a consortium or you have to cough up varying amounts of money. So some specs are open. The USB spec you can download, HDMI you can download. A lot of these you can just go online, maybe give up your email address, but you can get a PDF copy of the spec. A few of them though, like a PCI, PCI Express, you need to be a member of the group. SATA actually, you only need to pay 40 bucks for the spec. 
But for some ISO specs, it's almost extortion level pricing. It's like, I think like 100 euros per section of a spec in some cases, and 100 euros is, uh, what, $150 probably, I think, around 1.5 times. So per, fairly expensive. Um, sometimes, though, you can find these documents. Uh, a lot of companies really like to keep unsecured FTPs just floating around. And uh, a project I worked on in the past was a uh, just working on the PlayStation 2 emulator. And we actually stumbled across the entirety of Sony's documentation for it because some Korean game developer had left their FTP open for their developers. And in a directory, they had the entire dump of the SDK and the entirety of the documentation for the system. So that was pretty much a gold mine to hit. It's rare, but a lot of companies just kind of leave this around on accident. Sometimes you can stumble across this information. Um, so that was kind of dry overview of NDAs and intellectual property. And uh, now for this part, I was going to kind of look at some real life hardware that can fall victim to this and some other issues that crop up because this information is hidden behind, uh, is classified. So Arduino is fairly, it's open source and it certainly qualifies. Um, you can buy all the parts very easily, even from Radio Shack. The PCB is open source, the software is open source. It's as open as can actually be. Uh, every data sheet is available, and there's nothing horribly complicated on it. Um, every engineer will understand how the voltage regulator works. It's a basic microprocessor. We understand it very, very well. The only thing we really don't understand is the exact inner structure of the AVR itself, but practically we don't really need to know that, and it's not a very, very complicated microcontroller. Um, most people... Oh, uh, AVR is it's the... Uh, I'm not sure. I forget what AVR exactly is. Okay, yeah, so uh, AVR is just a microcontroller series made by Atmel, and they're just called AVRs, but I've heard varying definitions of the acronym, but their AVRs just refer to their processors. Yep. Uh, so, and most senior computer engineering students design a small processor as a project at some point in college anyways. So it would be very trivial to recreate a processor that emulated that instruction set and maintain compatibility with existing code. The more effort would probably be in relearning the manufacturing techniques for the chip and maybe the analog portions of it to, to match uh, the existing ADCs and such. But on the all, this is as open as it can practically be. Uh, Atmel is not going to publicly release the netlist uh, or the, the, the date level schematics of their chip. They don't need to. Um, X86, Sebastian has strong feelings about X86. Uh, it's 34 years old as of this year, and there's a lot of backwards compatibility just duct tape around it. Um, it's very incredibly well documented with regards to software. The developer manuals are out there. There's billions of lines of code written for this. The dev manuals are free, and there's a lot of compilers. GCC is open source. It's been around for decades. Very well documented on the software side. The hardware side, not so much so, especially compared to the beginning with the first 8080 and 8086. Now it's there's very, very little documentation on the hardware. Um, the chipsets have grown in exponentially in complexity. Um, the modern chipset can handle, uh, it handles the video links, it has PCI Express on it, it has serial ADA, it has USB, it has low pin count bus, it, it handles clock generation, it does a dozen things all on one 1,000 ball DGA chip. And without exacting documentation, it's, there's no way to figure out what what it does. Um, you can look at the data sheet, you might be able to get the pin out, but there's an extensive setup required in doing that. And the software required to get this high speed chip to talk to the CPU is significant. Um, I don't, has anyone heard of Core Boot, for chance? Um, Core Boot is, uh, is one of the leading efforts in the creation of a truly open source BIOS. It's been around for a while. Um, Unfortunately, full support for the latest generation chipsets is kind of a work in progress right now. Uh, Corbett works very well on older machines, but for the latest chips, it's kind of broken. Um, and all of us depend on closed source BIOS to get our machines running in the first place. Uh, I'm sure you've seen American Megatrends logo, Phoenix, Award, etc. It's your, your manufacturer paid for the license of that, and that's the code responsible for getting your machine from power on to a state where your operating system can take over. When you get to the OS stage, you can go completely open. You have Linux, you have the source code for that, and anybody can sit down and roll their own OS if they want. However, you're at the mercy of the BIOS in getting to that stage in the first place. That black box code is responsible for setting up your bus, your ACPI tables, and a lot of proprietary peripheral initialization. 
It's a fairly complex process to add code in there to correct errors made by the BIOS. If it misconfigures PCI bars and it gives you bad ACPI data in the terms of these tables. And I think um, most of the time it works fine, but I think in the past there's been issues for Linux users in the way the BIOS has treated them. I think uh, ThinkPads a while ago had issues with uh, the BIOS and Ovo shipping. And I remember seeing a lot of bugs on Ubuntu Launchpad about ThinkPad users that were suffering all these issues because Lenovo didn't really care about implementing proper support for Linux in their BIOS because it's not their target market. Um, on the hardware side, um, everything kind of just comes down to registers and often they are going to require very specific values programmed for proper functionality. Um, and these are some examples that I've seen. I've just slightly sanitized them, but this was the one right here. It's like, okay, this register needs to have these bits set and the only documentation is an email from some guy who works for the company, and that's it. That's the extent of the documentation. If these bits aren't set, you suffer system instability at just random intervals, and there's no way to really track it down because you forgot to set these three bits somewhere. A lot of times you'll see reserved um, for this silicon revision set to X, for the silicon revision set to Y, otherwise it won't function properly. Um, and then just straight reserved. A lot of places, a lot of data sheets will say, hey, this is reserved, set to this value or set to all ones, and internally the manufacturer can do whatever they want with it. For us, we have no idea what reserved really means. Maybe they're really just reserving it, or maybe they made some errors. Uh, they've got some serious silicon issues that they're fixing through setting values in this in these reserved registers. This is very time consuming and difficult for us to reverse engineer. Uh, the physical hardware isn't left out of the fun either. Um, you'll get things like this ball must always be tied to 1.5 volts for proper operation, reserved operation may be required in the future, or ball A1 must always tied to be tied to ground, otherwise undesirable behavior may occur. And by undesirable behavior, that could be an issue that manifests itself like every 100 hours your system might reset itself occasionally and how are you going to track it? And you'd have to track it down to, oh, internally this ball must always be connected to ground otherwise because of some manufacturing flaw that it could reset itself occasionally. So and so with the cost and size of these devices, these several hundred dollars, it's just not practical to try and use them without documentation. It's just throwing away money. Um, and that's if you can get the distributor to sell them to you in the first place. A lot of places will not even sell them to you if you wave money at them. They'll say, well, do you have a non-disclosure agreement signed? Like, do you have a vendor contact? Do you have all this? No, we're not going to sell it to you. Uh, who's, as, have you guys heard of Raspberry Pi, right? The upcoming uh, computer. They actually, I heard a uh, developer had a blog entry. They, it was like point key to get uh, Broadcom to sell them the system on a chip, which is the core of Raspberry Pi, because they weren't going to push 100,000 units a year. And it was, and Broadcom's like, you're actually going to cost us money in terms of supporting this. They somehow got Broadcom to agree, but that's, you know, that's a case in point here. You know, they wanted to use that chip, but, no, but what was that? Oh, does he work for Broadcom now? Okay. Yeah, probably then, yep. Oh, oh, he worked, okay, he used to work for Broadcom? Still work for Broadcom, okay. Okay. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep, exactly. So I guess, so that helps out the political side of it, but still Broadcom was like, well, we don't really want to sell you this because then we got to like dedicate a guy to supporting you for this, but eventually, if you were like, hey, we're supporting this nice cheap computer for learning and such, but there was, it was a fight to get that usable. I think they had a few alternatives lined up in case Broadcom didn't agree to let them use that chip. Yep. Mm -hmm. What was it, uh, Sandforce, like one of OCZ drives, or what the controller was? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I know a few of them. Yeah, I think a recent, a recent Intel SSD had a bug where on a reboot it would show up as an 8 meg drive because of a firmware bug, and it's like, and then it's like, well, make sure you back up your data before using these solid state drives, so. And yeah, it's some kind of weird edge case, right, that only they know about. Some, some li little bug in a million gates causes that. Uh, so for manufacturing, um, 
Uh, I guess, out of curiosity, how many people in here are engineers or PECs or similar? You, okay. So in school, we all learned the basic principles. We took electronics, we took circuits. We've got the basic math and theory behind these devices down. But manufacturing the devices is a different problem entirely, especially when you're talking 45 nanometer, 32 nanometer. This is, it's highly complicated. And almost all of them are trade secrets. Um, it's incredibly important in semiconductor manufacturer. Uh, foundries, uh, this is incredibly jealously guarded. If you want to do a design with that foundry, you need to sign an NDA with them in the first place to get access to their development tools and standard libraries for that process. Because this is this is this is how this is the affects their bottom line. If whoever makes the cheaper chips at a higher yield is going to dominate the market. Um, and if we lose if we lose that knowledge, we'd be looking at an incredibly serious setback. Uh, this knowledge is locked up, is tied up in companies, it's trade secrets, and if that's lost, we would be looking at reinventing a serious, serious amount of engineering. Um, so if we had to start over, I think we'd do it differently. Uh, we have an enormous amount of software deployed on x86. We've got knowledge of the register set and such. But we also get to start in, uh, oh, maybe it's the next slide. And you know, we've got centuries of programming time have gone into creating the development tools to support x86. Uh, major issue, you know, with an architecture is nothing without a working software ecosystem to support it. And we've got an incredible variety of dev tools. GCC, I think, has, I think they millions of man hours, if not more, in development time spent on making GCC what it is. And these are absolutely critical. But we would just, what's that? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, GCC is not a very, they're not a very efficient development wise, but they are, they, they have gotten, it's probably the best open source compiler you can get for x86. L, L, LVM is making progress too. Yeah. Uh, but we would sorely miss the process manufacturing experience. The, and those are the Intel Moon Soup guys. Um, you know, we, we've, the knowledge, you know, in university you can learn about this, but when you have 20 years of learning how to make chips, that's an incredible amount of institutional knowledge you've, you've kept locked up. You know, you're like, oh, hey, when we try to make this chip, X happened. But you don't share that with anyone else. You just keep it internal, like, all right, next time, let's not do this, and we can move on. And you improve your yields. But no one else knows that. They have to discover that again on their own. Um, you know, I, and I think we call it successful if we get our existing software base running again. But we get a chance to start fresh, hardware-wise. So right now, x86 has an anchor tied around its tied around itself of 30-something years of backwards compatibility. We would get the chance to start in 2012 with what we know, and we could design an underlying new architecture that still maintains compatibility with x86. Um, no, don't even bother investing huge amounts of time in trying to reverse engineer existing silicon. Um, starting with what we know now, the software we have to maintain, I think, you know, just starting with a whole new architecture would likely be the better option. And build and iterate as fast as possible to rediscover the process engineering. Um, trial and error is what, is how it's developed in the first place anyways. Each successive chip generation, they've learned, they've learned uh, what, what to do, what not to do. And the faster you keep doing trials, the faster you'll relearn this. And I think it would probably be better to make this type of knowledge, to some degree, make it to the public domain so it doesn't happen again. Um, right now, I'm not sure how much of that is in the public domain. I tried doing some research prior to this, and I could only really find, um, you know, funnily enough, some scientific papers and such that are behind the paywall. You need to subscribe to IEEE or the university student to get it. But there's very little public information on the process engineering as a whole. Um, and, and if we lose that knowledge, we'd be looking at serious setbacks again. And that, that is all. Um, AKA it was 4 a.m. in the morning. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much all I've got. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is go binary. Oh, okay. 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 Yep. Oh, 
Well, uh, uh, there's a company called uh, Chipworks, and they're a very, very uh, popular service. Um, and they, they actually offer service where they can decap an IC and perform analysis for you. And the, de the initial one is you can, I mean, any of us, you pay them about $100, you can send them a chip, and you'll get back a decap chip, and you can see the die. And then if you write them several very, very large checks and continue to write those checks, they'll actually assist you in performing competitive benchmarking, analysis, and such on that die. So with the ASIC, I mean, that's it's a very, very large chip to attempt to reverse engineer. And um, I think some of the Cisco devices, I think they have ASIC, but some of them also have FPGAs, so they're loading the code at runtime from a flash memory. So you could attempt to, to obtain that bit stream, and you could try to decode and reverse engineer the bit stream. But that can, I think Sebastian would know better than I if that's entirely feasible or not. For, no one's doing it, yeah. It's feasible, but... So maybe we just got to try it. But for and, uh, and and the ways FPGAs work is actually every time you power on the FPGA in a few few hundred milliseconds, it loads its configuration from a nearby memory chip. And it's only recently that manufacturers have begun to add encryption and protection to that flash memory chip. Otherwise, you could just read read the data out of that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It, it's encryption, yep. Google glitch a reset line or something to try. Yep. Yep. So ASIC stands for Application Specific Integrated Circuit. And uh, basically, an ASIC is if you. If if you need a chip for some purpose, and one dedicated purpose, and you want to make it yourself, that would be an ASIC. And you need to do, you have to calculate the economies of scale, because building an ASIC is an incredibly expensive process. But if you're going to be selling, if, if you A, if you need the performance, or B, if you're going to be selling an incredibly huge volume, it may actually be profitable in the long run to go to an ASIC. So I mean, technically, the, you know, like the chipset in my Mac, that's an ASIC. It's, it's a very specific circuit that is the controller hub for my Intel processor. So a lot of times people can do their development work on an FPGA because you can reconfigure that and program that. And perhaps down the line, they may port that design to an ASIC so they can run at higher clock frequencies, obtain better performance, et cetera. But it's not a, it's, I've never heard, I've only heard of a few smaller individuals actually pursuing the ASIC path. So the cost tends to limit it to companies that can afford it. Yeah, and actually, I, I, yep, and uh, there's a few uh, hobbyist level boards that start, I think, at like eighty, hundred dollars with an FPGA on board, and you can get started. Or yeah, or yeah, you know, just out of you could buy a Sebastian's Milky Mist board, and you get a very large FPGA with video interface, keyboard interface. Yeah, and you have a proven design which works on it. So, yeah. 